Series 2, Episode 13, and I'm speaking with Teo Eve. Hello, Teo. Good evening. Nice to see you again. Yeah, very nice to see you. And b- before we get into a conversation on the history of the alphabet, which is something I'm really excited to talk about, uh, let's have a bit of the history of you first. How did you end up getting involved with poetry? I think it's a common theme for either your guests or just poets in general. Um but writing has always been a massive passion of mine. It's such a cliche to say it, but it is one, like one of my earliest memories involves either making up stories with my brother or just using the word processor we had on the family computer in the living room to write stories and funny enough, experiment with fonts and lineation and sizes. Um, when I was growing up, we didn't have the internet in our house until I was about 15 or 16, I think. Um, And I was born in 1997. So most of my friends growing up had the internet, at least like as early as 10 years old. And I didn't. So when I was messing about with the computer, I had to find other things to do than just scrolling through YouTube. Uh, So writing sort of fell naturally to me because of that, because we only had a couple of games. I think we had one of those rudimentary Pong desktop games. Like, I think it was a really old computer, looking back at it. So we had a Pong game or a pinball game. No, it was a pinball game. Yeah, we had a pinball game and a word processor and a few other things I didn't know how to use. So naturally, I fell to the word processor and just started writing stories. And I remember when I was about six or seven, I was writing, well, I didn't know what fan fiction was back then. But I was writing Harry Potter fan fiction. I had recently watched the movies. I don't know if I'd read any of the books at that point. And I started writing a story inspired by Harry Potter with the Harry Potter characters. And one of the things I remember doing in this story, I've got no clue what it was about. But at certain points, I would decrease the size of the font and then increase it again to represent different things. I think that the characters were speaking on whispers or something, so I made the font smaller. It's a quite rudimentary experimentation. I don't really know what I was doing. I don't think I really knew in much detail what a book was supposed to look like back then. You know, I was less than 10 years old. Um, But interestingly, that's something that sort of resurfaced in my writing in later years, the idea of experimenting with font size and how the way that you present letters on the page can influence what the reader's reading as well as the words themselves but I went dormant on it for a while like I wasn't writing throughout my entire childhood um and certainly poetry came late to me I always preferred writing stories to writing poems but like quite a few of your guests um when I was a teenager I ended up getting involved in a band and was a lyricist and quickly realized that I couldn't sing And the sort of like frustration of wanting to get words across meant that lyric writing transformed quite naturally into poetry writing. And at first, these poems were basically lyrics without music. There was no formal structure. I wasn't writing in any sort of tradition that I knew of. I think it was just really rudimentary, in your face, overt, free verse, and the complete opposite of the kind of things that I write now. And I just kept up with writing poetry um, throughout the time I was at sixth form and then university. And I was always quite bad at it, I think. The lyrical stuff and the free verse stuff just never really came naturally to me at all. And I was ready to basically give up on poetry, I think. Um, By the time I started my master's, I had quite, I had a couple of poems published in various magazines, like either physical magazines or digital magazines. But even then I knew that those poems weren't very good or very much in my taste at all. So I sort of took a hiatus for a while and then started focusing on visual arts. Uh, Your listeners can't see, but you can see there's a painting behind me that I painted in the year between doing my BA and MA. I never got good at painting, I think like singing was something that I had an interest in and I still have an interest in painting, but I just never mastered the technical skills. But then while I was doing my master's, 
and enrolling in various creative writing modules. My creative writing MA lecturers, Vicky Sparrow and Lila Matsumoto, really pushed the idea that poetry doesn't have to be what we always think poetry should be if we look at like the history of poetry. Like they they really, really expanded my personal horizons of what poetry can be and sort of blew any preconceptions of what poetry should be that I had out of the water. And when experimenting in their classes with writing, I wrote a, I guess you will probably call it a calligram. It was a poem about a labyrinth in the shape of the maze, in the shape of like a crossword puzzle, almost. And one of the comments that one of my peers in the MA class said really got me thinking of poetry down the visual route. I mean, I'd been aware of really early works of visual poetry like George Herbert's Easter Wings. I say really early, but like, you know, 17th century, really early compared to the current tradition. I was aware of Easter Wings and vaguely aware of Guillaume Apollinaire, I think. Um, but I didn't really know much about visual poetry beyond that. But I'd written this labyrinth-shaped calligram and this person in the MA course looked at it and said that could hang in a gallery that's so like beautiful in the way it's presented and I think that reignited my passion for poetry when I realized that poetry didn't need to be this free verse form that I was so awful at mimicking and it could actually be used to express the things I wanted to express visually that I never really managed to do because I struggled with the actual medium of painting. You know that I also, I was I was in the band and I was writing lyrics. <laughs> and then when I stopped that and started writing poetry, I tried free verse, but I didn't try it for very long because I realized that I needed the structure to follow, some sort of thing to follow. So that's when I went to quite traditional formal poetry because you have the meter guiding you in much the same way that you'd have a, a melody. Did you try formal poetry or was it the structure provided by visual poetry that helped you? You know, I said that mostly I was writing free verse when I was younger, but I did actually write quite a few sonnets, I think, um, especially when I was in sixth form. I say quite a few. I think I mean about less than half a dozen or around half a dozen. And they had been the best poems I'd written up until that point. And I think I found one about a year ago. And I was reading it and I was like, I wouldn't dream of trying to put it out in the world, but it's not actually half bad. So I don't really know why I went, why I sort of diverted from following that path. Uh, probably because when I finished sixth form and entered my BA in creative writing, we were looking at lots of free verse poetry. And I don't think we looked at a single sonnet in our creative writing classes. Um, so that's probably why I stopped trying to write in traditional meter. It's something I've not really gone back to since, but maybe I should. Maybe I will one day. Well, you know, one, one of the things I like about your poetry is that you're willing to try out lots of different things. And there's, there's a lot of variety there. So who knows? Perhaps you will. Uh, so speaking of this, anyway, speaking of the variety in your work, Pentrack Press published a book of yours last year, The Ox House where each letter of the alphabet gets its own poem and some, some letters not in the alphabet, but we'll, we'll get onto that. And of course, in, in writing this book, you went on something of a journey of discovery about the history of the alphabet. And that's what I really wanted to talk to you about today. So let's start at, at the beginning, I guess. The, wow. <laughs> with, the, with the Sumerians and the Egyptians. They claim, you know, I, I knew you were talking about this and I feel like I should have revised because it's been probably about a year since I've actually read any of the books that informed my approach to Dark House. Uh, but we'll see what I can remember. We'll get there. <laughs> so the thing that sparked my interest in the history of the alphabet was an exhibition at the British Library in 2019, I think, called Making Your Mark. And it was just incredible. I mean, they had objects from all around the world showing old typographies. We had an old, there was an old printing press. Um, but the thing that really stuck out to me was in the corner, 
there was a small table with the ancient history of the alphabet and the actual origins of the alphabet. Uh, because I suppose it was more an exhibit about the history of the printed word, or written word and printed word, rather than the alphabet itself. And there was just this small exhibit, this small section in the corner that said, did you know that A is for ox or something like that? And I was like, what does that mean? And it was all about the history of one individual letter, the letter A, we see the first letter in the English alphabet. And it traced the history of the letter A from the Egyptian ox head hieroglyph, which is one half of where ox has got its name to the current symbol that we saw today. And it just blew my mind for several reasons. Um, for one thing, one of my early sort of like interests was ancient Egypt. As a kid, I was weirdly obsessed with ancient Egypt. And it was something I didn't, I hadn't thought about for many years. And eventually this sort of exploration of the history of the alphabet would lead me back to that initial interest, which was really nice and felt like a full circle moment when I started researching hieroglyphs as an adult and the influence of hieroglyphs on writing systems and potentially even on visual poetry. Um, but it also just blew my mind because I just thought, I can't believe I never asked where the alphabet came from. Like, I knew that there were different writing systems. I knew that the alphabet that we used used the Latin script, but I had never wondered where these letters actually originated from. And it's something that we use every single day, that we just take it for granted. Um, and I remember when I was in primary school, learning the shapes of the letters, and there was something really exciting about memorizing a letter and memorizing how to draw a letter, because really, we say that we write letters. When we're writing, we are writing, we're not drawing. But when you're learning to master the mechanics behind applying these symbols to paper, what you are doing is drawing. So it's always really exciting when you sort of obtain a new letter. But obviously, that's quite finite. There's 26 letters, arguably 52 different symbols, if you're counting uppercase and lowercase, even though we know that so many letters are just bigger when they're uppercase. But besides from that, I don't think I ever inquired anything about the alphabet. So I became really interested in the idea of, oh my God, so our letter system derives directly from the letter system or the writing system used in ancient Egypt, which just seems so strange to me even now, because when we look at hieroglyphs, they just seem so removed from anything that we conceptualize as written language in our culture today. And that's not just because they use much more detailed symbols to represent the sounds. It's because in hieroglyphs, there were many different things going on at different times. You know, you had some signs that represented one sound, some signs that represented two sounds, some signs that represented three sounds some signs that represented actually the object that they were depicting, some signs that were used to show how a word should be interpreted as well. Um, so completely different from the writing system that we use. Like it almost seems impossible in a way that the letters that we use derive from this highly complex writing system that yeah. the majority of us will never be able to understand. I mean, obviously hieroglyphs were <laughs> deciphered quite a while ago now, um, but even people who know how to read hieroglyphs can come up against difficulties sometimes just because the actual tradition of writing was so different back then. So the alphabet to me represents a sort of unbroken link between our contemporary civilization and an ancient civilization that when you look at its art, when you try to read its history, seems so almost alien from the civilization we know today. Yeah, it, it does seem very different. Yeah, but at the same time, don't you find that if you look back at the history of how the alphabet evolved, you end up thinking, well, of course, you know, how could it have evolved any other way? Of course, this is what's happened. It's like one yeah. of those things, once you know the answer, once you know it, it seems so obvious that there's no other way this could have happened. Absolutely. So, one of the things that I find so fascinating is like, you know, 
it's not just our writing system that derives from Egyptian hieroglyphs. It's Hebrew, it's Arabic, um, basically all of the writing systems around the Middle East and Europe derive from ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. And it was just a pure accident that some symbols developed in some ways and others developed in other ways, when they basically all developed essentially through, I mean, and I'm simplifying this, but essentially through a process of simplification and efficiency. How can we represent these signs more efficiently? Well, you get rid of the finer details, you draw it quicker, you draw it in a quicker way. And it just so happens that in Greece, letters started being drawn in one way, while in the Arabian Peninsula, they started being drawn in another way. And it's yeah. not just ancient Egyptian that looks so removed from the Latin alphabet. If you look at Hebrew, if you look at Arabic, you it's difficult to see how they are related if you look yeah. at like the well, you know the, the the Arabic equivalent to A. Hmm. You know what that is? It's just a straight line. But you you can trace it back from early Arabic. And you can see how it did start with, with that Phoenician alpha. Hmm. And it's just slowly unfurled to the, such an extent it's just ended up as a straight line. And knowing that, I mean, we know language changes. Um, language is changing all of the time. Language has, I feel like, a greater flexibility to change because language is communicated verbally, first and foremost, orally, first and foremost, and then it's written down later. And, you know, we've got evidence of language change um, throughout the whole history of written literature. But I wonder if our alphabet will ever change again, because you can still simplify the letters further. You can still represent the symbols in more simplified ways. But since the advent of the printing press, spelling has become so, spelling has become codified, but also the way that we produce letters have become so codified that it's an interesting question whether we have reached the end point of the development of the alphabet. I don't think we have. Um, well, think of emojis for one thing. Yeah, emojis. Um, absolutely. I mean, the digital revolution and the printed revolution have in one way clamped down the codification of writing, but in another way have opened up entirely new possibilities. For sure. So, well, let's go, let's look at the actual history then. So we start with pictograms in mm -hmm. Egypt and uh, and Sumer. So that this that's just drawing what you see. That's saying, okay, here's a bird. So it's just a picture of the thing you're talking about. And then it evolves into something called the rebus principle, where you might want to express, for example, a word like season. You might think, oh, how do you draw season? Okay, well, let's go with what it sounds like. So it sounds like sea and sun. So you might draw a sea, some wiggly lines to depict water and a sun so those two things together season the interesting thing about hieroglyphs is that they never lost their attachment to the sort of pictorial quality because while towards late egyptian hieroglyphs were used essentially as a writing system in the same way that we would understand a writing system today with symbols used to represent sounds that eventually formed into words Occasionally, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs would still use the hieroglyph that depicted the object that they were referring to. And sometimes the scribes would just put a line underneath it to represent, actually, we're talking about the object here and not about the sound. Mm. That's interesting, yes, because uh, the Sumerians didn't. They quickly went to these more glyphic representations. So the, Phoen the Phoenicians which is where we really think of as the alphabet as we know it as yeah. that so that that was inspired directly by Egypt some of the letters at least and i think that when we're talking about the history of the alphabet it's and this is why i i actually put in the additional information section of the ox house towards the end about section that it is in no way attempting to be a definitive history of the alphabet and while certain things are generally agreed by linguists and historians of the alphabet, like the fact that A derives from the Oxhead hieroglyph, these are all sort of reconstructions as well. Um, so many of our letters that, come, that came from the Phoenician alphabet are believed to be descended from Egyptian hieroglyphs. But there's also no guarantee that all of them were. 
and some of the histories are contested. Just researching this interview, I, I didn't know this before, but the Phoenician alphabet didn't have any vowels. So A wasn't a vowel in in their alphabet. So uh, there's a word, ab, it's an abjad. That's the type of alphabet the Phoenician alphabet was, an abjad, because it only had consonants. And vowel sounds were just implied by the consonants. Yeah. And Which... the Greeks didn't like this. Hmm. <laughs> so the Greeks didn't like it, so they introduced vowels and because they had no use for alpha because it was a kind of in phoenician it was kind of glottal stop throaty sound that the greeks didn't use so they just assigned alpha a vowel sound yeah it's interesting isn't it because the latin alphabet the cyrillic alphabet and the greek alphabet are some of the only alphabets to my knowledge or writing systems to my knowledge that actually have specifically assigned vowel sounds because Hebrew, when it's written, can be written with vowels, but often isn't. Um, lots of writing systems incorporate vowel sounds as sort of additions, almost in the same way that certain languages that use the Latin writing system use accents. Um, in syllabic writing systems, like Japanese kanji, the vowel is included in the sort of character uh, characters sound uh, with characters that represent syllables instead of individual sounds. Um, so yeah, it's vowels are weirdly rare. Like specific symbols that represent that explicitly represent vowels that have the same sort of value as consonantal letters aren't that common across writing systems, to my knowledge, at least. Uh, which you think will pose a lot of difficulties. But I suppose if you were to take out, that, if you were to get a block of text written in English that's properly punctuated and remove all of the vowels, most of the time you're going to be able to read what's being said. Sometimes you'll encounter words that you won't be sure if they are supposed to be one word or another word, but you'll be able to figure out by context most of the time. I mean, ancient Egyptian had some vowel sounds, but they also weren't considered to be necessarily necessary, and often words were written purely consonantally. That's interesting, because we still have lots of vowel sounds in English, but only five or six letters there to represent them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how many, do you know how many vowel sounds we have in English? Is it something like 12 or maybe even more? Yeah, we have, we have 20, 20 vowel sounds. In English. 20 vowel sounds and five vowels. It's interesting because, so I'm half Italian. I mean, there's an argument to be made that Italian and English don't actually use the same alphabet because in the Italian alphabet, there are five fewer letters. And these letters are used when you're writing like brand names or international names, but they're not counted as the alphabet, uh, which is really interesting. So J, K, and a couple of others. Um, are used in written Italian, but they're not counted as part of the alphabet. But despite the fact that the Italian alphabet and the English alphabet are ostensibly the same thing, one is just longer than the other, the English alphabet has so much more, or letters used in the English alphabet have so much more diversity of sound values compared with Italian letters. Italian is a highly standardized language. There are a few odd rules where a certain combination of letters make distinct sounds. But in Italian, generally, one sound has one letter and one letter has one sound. So there are basically just five vowels in Italian, one for each of the vowel letters that we actually use. Compared with English, is 20, which uses the same five vowel letters. I didn't know that. So you reminded me of Welsh a bit there with, again, J and K might be used occasionally in Welsh, but they're not part of the alphabet. They're not They're not welcome into that club. <laughs> I didn't know that about Welsh. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, you can see the sort of like historical reasons behind it, because if these languages were written primarily without using these letters, there'd be no need for them to be included in the alphabet, in alphabet books for like teaching, reading and writing. Uh, and it's a surprise that if you go into an Italian shop and buy an Italian computer, it's going to use the QWERTY keyboard or the Xerti or 
a standard keyboard with all of the 26 letters. It'd be interesting to wonder whether these letters will eventually actually be integrated into these alphabets when the normal format that we encounter any sort of letters when we're typing anything now is to have these 26 signs right in front of us. But I suppose on a flip side, Italian has accented letters, which is something we don't really have in English at all. And there's an argument to be made that are accented letters the same letters, but with different values, or are they different letters completely? I mean, they're not included in the, alpha, the Italian alphabet, but I suppose that is a way that they get around heading five vowels and slightly more than five vowel sounds, depending on pronunciation. Yeah, well, to, I mean, to answer your curiosity about Welsh, the, the reason we don't, they don't have K in, in Welsh is because there's no soft C. So C is always K. Hmm. And then obviously you just use S for anything that would otherwise be a soft C. I mean, some letters just feel so redundant in English, don't they? And that hmm. only they only exist because of historical reasons, essentially. I mean, X and C, especially the two that come to mind, because C is always either an S sound or a K sound. I suppose the uh, most useful thing about it is when it's combined with the H to be a CH sound. But besides from that, it's always representing one of two different sounds. X is a strange letter in that it always represents either the K or S sound or sometimes a Z sound. Uh, and it's interesting to note that we haven't shed any of these letters either. Considering all of the letters that English has shed throughout its history, or that writing systems have shed, it's interesting to note how some have sort of lingered on, even though their sound values can be expressed in other ways. And I suppose in the same way that it's difficult to tell whether we'll ever actually see the introduction of any new letters, now that everything comes with the standard 26, mm. it's difficult to see us actually ever shedding any letters either. Yeah. Well, let's, let's see why that's the case. Pick back up on the history. So we've got the the Greeks and then next the Romans. So this is when we get the alphabet as we know it. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, because it's a podcast, we can't show the evolution of the letters and how something that looks like a bull's head turns into a glyphic representation of a bull's head and then just gets distorted again. It gets turned around a lot, which is interesting, sort of rotating. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and we eventually end up with the letter A, the letter B, first represented a house, hence the, the name house. of the book. Hence the ox house, basically a really roundabout way of saying that alphabet. So then when we get to Latin, am I correct that we have 23 of our 26 letters? Yeah, 23. G came later. So G was introduced during Roman times because the Romans inherited from the Etruscans who were sort of like in between the Phoenicians and the Romans. Um, the C letter shape, which originally represented a throwing stick, or potentially one of the potential interpretations for its original iteration was a throwing stick. But the Romans had a sound for, had a C sound and also a G sound, so a kurt and gur, but they only inherited this one symbol. Uh, so in a really, I think, really eloquent way of inventing a new letter, wasn't to create a brand new sign that had no precedent that wouldn't fit in with the design of the letters. They just corrupted the C. So if you look at a capital C and look at a capital G, the capital G is just a C with a line going through it to sort of represent the harder sound. And that fit really nicely in with the way that Latin letters will be inscribed in stone. So by the end of the Latin period, by the end of the Roman period, we had 23 of the letters, yes. It, it's easy to just gloss over it, but of course, the language itself, Latin itself, was evolving over a long period of time. But by the end of it, we get these 23 letters. So we're missing J, U, and W. Mm -hmm. Although we're not quite missing U, because U is a strange one. Because the symbol V, it represented both. It represented the vowel sound we know as U. And in Latin, the consonant sound wasn't the V we know now. It was it was a W sound. Yeah, V, as we will use it today, has a completely different value from how it would originally be used. And despite being the oldest of the set out of the U and W, uh, 
So you'd think that it will be the one that did actually retain its sound value. And these other symbols would have come by afterwards to represent new sounds. It's actually gone on to represent the V sound when you're absolutely right. Uh, the Romans would use it as a sort of sound that was between a U and a W. I came, I saw, I conquered. is isn't Veni, Vidi, Vici. It's Weni, Widi, Vici. Which sounds slightly more silly when you're saying get loud. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what that's what would have been said. And then some somehow that became a V sound. But even when it became a V sound, it was the same glyph that V was being used as both the U vowel and the V consonant. Yeah, there was a really strange spelling convention. Uh, so one of the really interesting things about the sort of advent of the printing press is that, I mean, for one thing, spelling had to be standardized for the first time in history, essentially. Um, documents were being shipped to all over countries, all over the world. So to make sure that everyone knew that they were reading the same text, there was a process of spelling standardization that was possibly partially like, well, partially the result of the printing presses themselves and partially the result of dictionary compilers who decided that, okay, yes, we need to absolutely definitively state how certain words are spelled. But early sort of printing conventions were less about how words were actually supposed to be spelt and more about some really obscure rules. So V, the V sound um, or the V shape would be used to represent any V or U sound at the start of a word for a while, while V or U sounds in the middle of words would be represented by the letter we now know as U. So you would still have these Vs and U letters being represented being used to represent two different sounds. And which was chosen wasn't about wasn't about the sound that they were representing, but rather where that sound was in the word. And then so, so how come that's, do you know, I suppose maybe nobody knows, how we then ended up saying, okay, let's let one be the consonant and let the other one be the vowel, instead of using them <laughs> as both sounds. I don't actually know. I've got my copy of a has got ox by Lynn Davies out in front of me, which is my Bible for letter history. And on the, the entry for U, it just says, it was only in the 18th century that the current convention of U for U and V for V gained general acceptance. It's not actually gone into any detail about why, but I suppose early printing presses, while there was this process of standardization, there's a lot of experimentation going on. You know, prior to this, all documents were handwritten. So printers had to sort of create an entire new tradition about how to convey the written, uh, the written word. So I suppose some experiments just stuck and some fell to the wayside. I mean, possibly one of the ones that throws most people off is the long S, which looks like an F. Um, so for those who don't know, the long S is a sign that looks a lot like a lowercase f, but without the bar running across the middle. And it will be used to represent an S, I believe, when there was a double S. Um, and at the start of words, I'm not, I might be mixing that up with the middle of words, but off the top of my head, I think the long S was used at the start of words and when there were double S's. Um, it's easy to know why that one died out, just because it was more efficient to have one sign for S rather than two mm. when printing presses could only have a certain amount of letters. The printing presses, uh, we, there's a lot we can blame on them. I think they they took away a, a lot of things and they added things they shouldn't have. You know, the the great vowel shift, I don't know if you've come across this much in your, your readings, but that period of about 200 years where all the vowels changed their sounds and words like like hate used to be pronounced heart hmm. and uh, show used to be pronounced shoe. And then suddenly everything changed. People speculate it's got something to do with people traveling around the country more because of the Black Death. So mixing more and language evolving that way. But the trouble is that this happened around the time that the printing press was invented. Mm -hmm. So with all these vowel changes and as a knock-on effect, words being pronounced very differently, 
you had a word like night, K N I G H T, mm. used to be pronounced Kniggert. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it was being pronounced night. But this happened when the printing press was invented. So we were, st we're now stuck with that ridiculous spelling that doesn't make any sense phonetically. I, I mean, you know, I'm an English teacher um, by profession. And it's interesting because so much of my time I spent correcting students' spellings and saying, this is spelled wrong, this is spelled wrong, spell this right. And what we're seeing there is just students representing words based on how they would be spelled if English was phonetic. I mean, we were talking a bit earlier about different sort of writing systems, uh, syllabic writing systems, pictorial writing systems. And while English is an alphabetical writing system, it's sort of this weird, bizarre hybrid where most of the time letters represent sounds and words are represented by virtue of these sounds and letters coming together. But quite often, in the cases of words like night, the letters don't represent the words at all. You need to yeah. learn the shape that happens to be composed of multiple symbols that we know individually to be letters, but that bear no real relation to the letters in terms of pronunciation. So yeah. English was mostly alphabetical, but with some really obscure random combinations of symbols thrown in here and there yeah and this is the problem because we're stuck with the old spelling because the spelling was set in stone by the printing press mm -hmm. at the time at the exact same time that we were starting to pronounce the word differently so if the printing press hadn't existed until 100 years afterwards perhaps we would have spelt night n-i-t-e and I'll probably spend a lot less of my time underlining students' words and in red and telling them to rewrite it until they spell it correctly. Yeah. By the way, have you, have you heard of hypercorrection in the early days of the printing press? I've not, no. This is interesting. So we had the words, the word dumb, D-U-M-B, which would originally have been pronounced dumber, and then obviously it gained a silent B. But in the early days of the printing press, Printers were writing words like limb, L I M B, even though that B never existed. Limb was always pronounced. Limb was always pronounced like, as in L I M. Was it just because the idea of dumb as the way that you spell those words that M with B just became so wide, widespread? Exactly. Yeah. It was, so it's called hypercorrection because there, there wasn't a mistake to be corrected, but they were correcting it anyway, assuming that limb had to be the same as dumb. And now a few centuries down the line, poor English teachers spend so much of their time correcting work that really, you know, I mean, it's interesting when you tell someone, or there's a real tension between being someone who is familiar with the history of languages, the history of writing, the history of the written word, and someone who is expected to teach students to comply with rigid rules that I know to be completely arbitrary. And it is this constant, or this like, upholding of the idea of certain set conventions, spelling conventions, as absolute and unquestionable, mm. that does make me ask questions about, you know, are we seeing a sort of like natural end of the alphabet changing, the alphabet expanding? And like I said earlier, I don't think that we have. I don't think that these 26 letters are going to be the final iteration of the written word, of the written word in the English language. But by virtue of First, the printing press, and then mass education, and now digital technologies that automatically correct your spellings and your capitalizations so that they fit in line with the conventions that we've come to believe to be sacrosanct. We're doing so much to suppress a sort of like natural evolution of spelling and writing conventions, essentially. Yeah, and if you have a student who, who spells Lim, L I M, they could argue that they're more correct than you. Mm -hmm. they're, they're more correct than the rest of us who are, who think that we're correct. Uh-huh, absolutely. I don't think that would help them pass their exams, but they could <laughs> argue it. So what else have we got? So we've got the, the I, uh, sorry, J. J is mm -hmm. just a fancy I, so far as I could tell from what I've read about it. Yeah, J's the youngest. Um, so, I mean, I was saying that, is it going to be difficult for new letters to be sort of introduced? But J 
as far as I can tell, was is the youngest. And at first it was this an elongated eye, uh, used much in the same way that the G would be introduced to sort of differentiate a letter that represented two sounds. Uh, so the I would represent both the I sound, which, as we know, has many different sounds within it. Uh, so then this new longer I was used to represent this J sound. Yeah, and then so and the one was W, which is probably the one that anyone can figure out where that came from. It's a it's a W, and of course it had to represent the old V sound, which had become V instead of W. I think that's called a W when really it's two Vs put together. Maybe if you're drawing it by hand, it's going to look more like two U's squashed together. But most of the time, it's two Vs. It should be a double V, not a double U. It should. We we could argue that. But so, yeah, effectively, it replaced the Latin V and it literally replaced the win, which is a runic letter that, that had that sound, which leads us nicely on to the runic alphabet and that yep. influence upon English. Yep. So, and this is where things get really complicated, um, because when we're talking about the history of the alphabet in English now, we're talking about the history of language through the... Egyptians via the Etruscans via the via the Phoenicians via the Etruscans via the Romans, um, and no old English rune still exists in the English alphabet, which is probably not bizarre when you consider the standardisation of printing throughout Europe and the fact that so many of the signs that were used to represent uh, all the runic signs just didn't exist on continental Europe. And obviously London was a major center of printing, but the majority of the major centers of printing were on the continent by virtue of the fact that the European continent had bigger landmass than just this one island. Uh, so naturally, I think about six or so different letters all just died out because printers wouldn't didn't feel the need to mint winds or thorns uh, when they could represent these same sounds using letters that existed in all of the countries that used the Latin alphabet. My favourite, and you, you probably know my favourite of these letters is the thorn, mm -hmm. which has a, a th sound. Ye um, old. Yeah, but then that's, it's actually, that's the longest survivor. I think I'm correct in saying that was the longest surviving in the English language, despite the fact that when, when the Normans invaded in 1066 they you know they brought their, their French influence and, and the French didn't have any love for the thorn they didn't know what it was and they already were using just th to represent that sound perfectly perfectly well enough and yet it still survived about 400 years after that and it seems um, to again it seems to be the printing press that eventually killed it off yeah I mean I said that printing presses wouldn't mint these letters that weren't being used but you're absolutely right in that the Norman conquest of Britain did a lot to, because obviously the people who are writing throughout the majority of history up until the printing press and mass literacy were the upper classes. So you're absolutely right in that when the Normans invaded and suddenly you had a French aristocracy in control of England, they will be writing in their Latin script, which hadn't been impacted by uh, runes like the runes had impacted or infiltrated the Latin alphabet that was used in England. Um, but yeah, I suppose one of the reasons why Thorn could live life as long as it did was because it started to look very similar to a Y shape. Mm. So even though it represented a completely different letter value, it was using a symbol that was familiar to the people writing at that time. And it meant that when the printing press was invented, there didn't have to be a separate Thorn symbol because people could choose to use the Y to represent the thorn. Not that I'm aware of many books that actually intentionally use the thorn, but as we know, thorn has set, had sort of like a second life in retrospective and nostalgic typography that sort of is used to evoke old English life. Um, because when you're seeing a sign that says like ye old sweet shop or ye old so-and-so, you're not seeing a sign that says ye at all. You're seeing a sign that says the dirt because that Y is representing this TH. Yeah. 
I, t- I, I honestly, if I could bring back one letter, that's that's the one. Well, luckily, you don't need to invent a new Unicode symbol to represent it. You can just start using the Y every time you're meaning to write TH. Well, I think you know, in in this day and age, we can use as many different characters as we want, can't we? So why not why not bring some of these back? I had an idea once to you to write a book set in like pre Norman Conquest England that used the old English runes. Uh, but then I decided that that will be, I don't know, there's a weird, like, part of me feels, as someone who's interested in the history of language and the history of the alphabet, part of me feels like there'll be something really interesting about incorporating old English letters that were lost throughout history into, like, contemporary writings. But then another part of me thinks that that could potentially get so bound up with national identity politics that it, I feel like it'll be an interesting intellectual exercise. But if you're reproducing this sort of symbolism of an old nostalgic England, all of the potential ramifications that that could have. If, well, you're thinking uh, it's, it's like saying, you know, get out French. We don't, we don't need you. We well, don't need you Normans coming here, <laughs> changing our language. I think you know, it's, it's a long time ago. We can, we can forgive and forget. Yeah, I mean, not quite to that level, but um, it's interesting, isn't it? And it's interesting how the reintroduction of old symbols that we've since lost. So if anyone's not aware of what a win looks like, I recommend you to look it up because it's they all feel like they could potentially fit quite seamlessly in with the 26 letters that we use today. Um But by virtue of the fact we're not used to seeing these signs in the same way we're used to seeing the other 26 signs, they're not part of the alphabet. They do feel quite alien in and of themselves. And when I was was younger, I used to be fascinated by writing uh, systems, not for any like linguistic quality, because when I'm saying when I was younger, I mean when I was younger. I didn't have an intellectual fascination with them as such. as such. I wasn't learning any of them. But I would just enjoy looking at text printed in different writing systems and thinking how beautiful the letters were and thinking how ugly Latin script was in comparison. Like if you look at Sanskrit, if you look at Hindi, if you look at Arabic, the writing systems look so beautiful and artistic and obviously Arabic and Chinese calligraphy have such well strong histories of calligraphy and are integrated into visual arts quite seamlessly. Um, whereas I used to think Latin letters were just so ugly by comparison. And now I'm just wondering if that's just because of overexposure, because you look at a win and you can just think, and maybe I'm just weird, but you can just think that looks so beautiful. It's such a beautiful, elegant shape. And really is the only reason why that's beautiful. And a K, for instance, doesn't hold that much aesthetic appeal to me because even though the K is a, you know, like essentially micro piece of abstract art, I can't remove the associations of that symbol with the phonic quality K with the letter K. You're so used to it, you're not going to see the, you don't necessarily see the beauty in things that, that you, you see a hundred times a day or a thousand times a day. Exactly, which was part of the motivation for writing The Ox House to me, I think, was sort of rediscovering that excitement of what the alphabet is, what the alphabet could be, and sort of claiming the Latin, or like, you know, a sort of book written in defence of the Latin alphabet as a sort of, writing system that has some sort of aesthetic visual value yeah and just before we leave uh, the runic alphabet alone you probably know this anyway but people listening might not this is a great thing about the, the runic alphabet that there are no horizontal lines but every line is straight so if you look at all the all the characters in that alphabet it's just straight lines no curves and there are no horizontal lines and this is because it was written the most of the time it was written, it was carved into wood. So they'd hold the wood so that the grain was running horizontally, which allowed them to do vertical lines and diagonal lines, no curves, because that'd be too hard, hmm. and no horizontal lines, because if you do that along with the grain, 
the word splits. Mm. So that gives the runic alphabets. I think when you see the runic alphabet laid out all as one, it looks amazing because of that. You, you kind of pick up on the fact that there are no horizontal lines and that every line is either vertical or diagonal. And it makes it quite a, it's quite an imposing looking alphabet, I think. Yeah, and it's interesting how the writing systems are invariably affected by the technology that's used to produce that. Because if the runic alphabet wasn't carved into word, it would look completely different. And even like when you're looking at, you know, I said Google win, if you're not sure what it looks like, chances are the first thing that's going to come up is a win with curvature, because that's a representation of win that's been drawn on a computer or drawn using a pen rather than carved into word. Um, and I, I guess for, say, Chinese writing, it would have been mostly painted. I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert on this at all, but... I'm thinking there's a slightly opposite of the runic alphabet where something has always been depicted in a more fluid manner. So are you going to have more curves and more overlapping lines and, and more freedom, I guess, in the form? Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it? When I mean, I don't speak Mandarin and I can't read Chinese characters at all. Uh, so maybe it's the same sort of difficulty anyone has when they're encountering the text in a language that they don't speak. But some symbols used in... Chinese writing are so complicated with so many different moving parts of them, to so many different brush strokes, that when you see these symbols through a computer screen and everything is sort of squashed together, you find it quite amazing that people can tell these signs apart. And of course, it's not amazing because it's just the sort of letters that people are used to. And I think that people will be forgiven reading Latin or encountering the Latin script, you don't know how to read uh, languages written in the Latin script for like getting P's and Q's confused, for instance. But yeah, the sort of like digitization of the Latin alphabet, I think because these shapes use so few different parts because quite often these letters in their very iterative states in history were carved either onto temple walls or like relief sculptures so now most of our letters have very few lines themselves, uh, which is the complete opposite, as you say, to like Chinese characters that use so many different brush strokes. Yeah, the uh, the Latin alphabet was all uppercase, and so that goes along with what you're, what you're saying that uppercase characters tend to have fewer curves in them, more straight lines. Yeah, um, and lower cases. I mean, at first they weren't called lower cases at all so where we actually i don't know if you know this you probably do uh do you know where we get the terms lowercase and uppercase from oh from yeah that's that's a printing press term isn't it with that's a printing the, press the term. case that was higher up is the uppercase yeah yeah so uppercase and lowercase quite simply the letters that we see as capital letters will be in a case that was higher up than the lowercase uh then the smaller letters which were in the lower case it's lowercase um so what we call minuscule writing sort of developed in handwritten texts, like promoted by scribes. Um, and quite often there were, or for a while, there were two sort of competing traditions of uppercases will be used in sculptures when carving, but then lowercase letters will be used in handwritten documents. And it was only later that the tradition of using a capital letter at the start of first reams of text and paragraphs and sentences was introduced so even when what we now call lowercase letters came into existence they weren't being used alongside what we now call uppercase letters they'll be used in two separate sort of writing traditions and then only later did the with the sort of rise of medieval manuscripts that had illuminated letters that really where scribes can really take the time to sort of celebrate the letter shapes in the creation of these really lavish intricate books that were essentially created to show off the wealth of the church and to praise god by virtue of that did the tradition of having an uppercase and lowercase which obviously weren't called uppercase and lowercase at the time uh, come about Let's have one more thing about the alphabet before we move on to other stuff, because I've mentioned my favourite 
letter that no longer is no longer a letter but the thorn uh my second favorite and i think i think a lot of people like this one is the ampersand mm -hmm. so i think we'll, we'll have to talk about that a little bit yeah you know ampersand is an interesting one and i'm still not sure if it ever was actually considered a letter because occasionally it was used as sort of the 27th letter in the alphabet song and in the english alphabet um but i'm not sure i've never actually managed to find any like concrete thing saying that it was widely considered to be a letter and i don't know if that's anything that you've come across at all because it's a ligature isn't it it's a combination of the et and we see the latin et which became the character we now see as the ampersand today in munich and um and i don't know if this is true or if this is just a story but where the word ampersand comes from, according to what I've managed to find, is when people are saying the alphabet, they get to Z, and then they'd say, and per se, and, and then those I've words that, yeah. come together to form the ampersand. So a ligature is a symbol, but then also, in a way, a word in ligature, various different words come together to form one word, the same way that the E and the T came together to form one symbol. Yeah, I mean, I call it I call it a ligature, and therefore it can't be, technically speaking, a letter. It's certainly I, I certainly never think of it as punctuation, which is what some people say. It's not it's not punctuation, is it? I mean, it's why simple. can't it, why can't it be all? Why can't it be a letter and a ligature and punctuation? <laughs> I think I I use, I think I probably use it in a way that's almost more like punctuation. I mean. Most of the time, when I'm writing, I just spell out the word A and D. But when I'm right, sometimes I sort of use the ampersand instead of a comma or semicolon, I think. If I'm linking to, like in self-consciously poetic writing, I wouldn't do this when writing an essay or anything official because... Even though we're poets, we both know that when we're writing official documents, we still need to be abiding by the general, generally accepted spelling and grammar conventions. Uh, but in some of my poetic writings, if I've got two clauses that both use the word and in them, and I want to link those two clauses together, I'll use the ampersand to link those clauses together to sort of differentiate these clauses. So sometimes there'll be a sentence with three ands in them. Twice they'll be yeah. represented by the word A and D. I do something similar, yeah. But again, yeah. It's only in the, like notes to myself. I, I wouldn't do it if anyone's going to read it, I think. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that in the early days of printing, what symbols were used would be more to do with uh, certain arbitrary conventions rather than spelling and punctuation. And I suppose, in a way, we're almost doing the same things, aren't we? We're not using an ampersand just to represent the A and D word. We're using the ampersand to represent and, but in a very specific context. Mm. That's very true. So, well, let's talk poetry now. We've been talking over an hour. So it's, it's been it's been fascinating. It's, it's a really interesting topic. And I'll, I'll have to put a link to the book that you mentioned. Could you mention the name yes. again? It is A is for Ox by Lynn Davies. And I've actually got a story about this book that I'm just going to say really quickly. Uh, while Ox was saying, this talk has made me realise I need to revise my history of the alphabet because it's been a while since I've brushed up. Um, but I got, as you know, and I think I actually shared with you the really early documents, I had the idea for a book called The Ox House about the history of the alphabet way before I'd written any poems that would eventually come into the book. And at first my first sort of iteration of the book was essentially really bad lyrical verse about the alphabet that I hope never sees the light of day. Um, but when I decided I wanted to actually sit down and properly write a book ostensibly about the history of the alphabet, and even though the final book isn't about the history of the alphabet, my original conception of the idea would have been more overtly about the history of various letter forms, I was looking for books online about the history of the alphabet. And I found loads, which in one way was really thrilling 
because it was something that I didn't think many people would because it wasn't anything that maybe it was just like me being arrogant that I thought I had never thought of this before why would other people but dozens of books about the history of the alphabet and I was sort of arm in arm about which one to buy um this was during the coronavirus pandemic so I was just doing all of my shopping online uh, so I couldn't really sample many of the books because I didn't really have sample chapters and then one day I went to my local Tesco just doing a bit of shopping and this local Tesco had a book trade section and on my way out of the shop I pause just to look at the books on the book trade shelf and I see this really mysterious looking beautifully printed edition of a book um I pick it up and see along its spine so it's got a I mean viewers at listeners can't see this but the book came in a sort of cover so it's a hardback with a sort of dust jacket kind of thing so I couldn't see the name of the book on the dust jacket but I saw on the spine that was called A is for Ox and I was like wait is that going to be like a storybook about the letter A and the history of the letter A or is that going to be like a poetry book in exactly the style of things I want to write um so I picked it up looked at it and it was just this beautifully beautifully illustrated volume about the history of the alphabet going through the history generate than the history of each individual letter form. Um, and I just found it by complete chance. So, you know, saved myself some money because I didn't have to buy a book online. And that sort of kicked off me actually writing The Ox House. Uh, so that book is A is for Ox by Lynn Davies, published by the Folio Society. Great. I don't own the copy, so I will have to get one. And so this was the book that inspired the Ox House, and I was I was very proud to publish that book last year. Uh, next year, twenty twenty four, there will be another book of yours through Pantrack Press. Now this is even more into the visual poetry side. Yeah, absolutely. was that a conscious decision, or has it just happened naturally? So I think that so for those who haven't seen the Ox House, it's sort of half art and half poetry in that. Each poem is titled as a letter, but the letter's title is presented as a full page illustration of the letter in a sort of black and white homage to medieval manuscripts, illuminated letters. Um, so even though the Ox House is ostensibly a book of poetry, it's as much a book of art as it is a book of poetry. There's as many art pieces in it as there are poems, but some of the poems themselves are also visual poems. And I think after finishing writing the Ox House, I didn't really know what to do next. Um, I was a bit flabbergasted that a book of mine had been picked up for publication by Pentarette Press, no less, um, and sort of felt like, well, I'm never going to top this, which is a ridiculous thing to think when you've had one book published, to sort of think that that's going to be like some insurmountable obstacle that you're never going to be able to overcome. Um, but I we, have, we have strange thoughts after the, every time I finish a book, I think, right, I'm never doing that again. Yeah. Never. Oh, every, every single time it's like, well, that, this is it. This is hanging up my pen, hanging up my quilt. Um, but I didn't really know where to go. And I think I spent a good while. I was, I had written a sort of more traditional poetry pamphlet slash collection at various different iterations that I was sort of like peddling out and I think I think really I knew it wasn't very good um but I sent it out to some publishing houses and it was often getting long listed or short listed but never quite accepted and I was like should I tinker with this but I don't know I don't really feel passionate for it I don't really feel like this style of poetry is really me I don't really know what to do um but then once I just had a idea to overlap the words, and I think Sonnet 114 by William Shakespeare. So the first poem I consciously wrote for this, can I say the name? Am I allowed to say the name? Okay. I'll allow it, yes. Okay, so the name of the collection is going to be I Imagine an Image. Um, very suitable for a visual poetry collection, I think, and a collection in which many of the poems are consciously about imagism. But the first poem I consciously wrote for that collection, or the first poem I wrote that sort of became the springboard for me putting this together, was a sonnet. Uh, I did air quotes there. 
Um, <laughs> it doesn't work on the podcast. Yeah, it doesn't work on the uh, podcast. Uh, so air quotes, sonnet of the first 14 words of, I think, Sonnet 114 by William Shakespeare. I can't remember off the top of my head. But each of the letters of each of the words were overlaid. So if you look at it on a page, it's quite difficult to read. And I think it's not immediately obvious that these strange symbols are necessarily words. Um, and I really loved it. It wasn't, you know, a line I had written. It wasn't a line of verse. It was a line of verse by Shakespeare that I just sort of stolen. But I thought the presentation was just really aesthetically beautiful, like in and of itself. The words themselves mean very little without the context of the rest of the poem. Um, but the presentation was just aesthetically pleasing. And that sort of brought me back to thinking about what this person I studied the creative writing master's module with had said about my uh, labyrinth poem, that I just thought that would look really nice in an art gallery. So I think I started right, making these pieces, not really consciously thinking I was going to put together a collection, but I was just experimenting with how to make words look beautiful. Um, and I wrote another poem in a sort of similar style. And then I start, and then I created two pieces that were much more abstract, that were using just the letters C to represent, to sort of like be a visual painting representing in one of them, it's like kisses coming together, then going apart. And then another one of them is sort of like, depending on how you look at it, either two people hugging or two people like parting. Um, and then I thought, okay, I know what I'm doing here. And it just sort of snowballed. So I imagine an image has quite a few poems that are very abstract in that they are literally just art pieces or pieces of visual poetry that don't actually have a semantic element. And then others which combine semantic elements with visual elements, so essentially concrete poems or calligrams, and other poems which don't have much of a visual element themselves, but are about visual poetry or about imagism, or some of them are almost like micro-manifestos of writing images poetry. So yeah, I think that one weird overlapping sonnet that I did just sort of brought me out of my writing slump showed me the direction I needed to do. I always been fascinated, you know, since since sort of like really doing a deep dive into Polynair, which I did during the lockdown, and having that comment that my peer from the creative writing class had in mind, I was really preoccupied with visual poetry. I finally sort of found a way to really focus on that. Well, it's good, and, it, and it's interesting. I, I can certainly look back at my poetry career and think there are certain poems which just kick-started things again yeah and the thing about that is that um, quite a few of the poems in i imagine an image were poems that had originally been in some shape or form this verse collection i've been peddling out to other publishers that i think had a decent start or like a decent idea behind it but i hadn't quite found the form that they needed to exist in so even though i first consciously wrote the shakespeare sonnet um, I then went back to sort of remix some of my old poems into a style that sort of gelled. And yeah, the discovery of a form can really bring out an idea or bring in an idea or shape an idea, form yeah, an idea. Definitely. And I really like this manuscript. I'm proud to be publishing it. And much like the Ox House, it's the variety. You're not just sticking to one formula. There are lots of ideas, uh, especially around structure and visual form. And you seem to have a very varied practice anyway, because you mentioned earlier that you used to prefer writing stories to writing poems. Well, you're still writing stories, aren't you? You're still writing novels, in fact. You know. I'm trying to, yeah. <laughs> How many novels have you have you written? Um, I think the official answer to that is one, and that's still in the process of editing. Um, and then an uh, entire second draft, Oh, an entire first draft or second one that I really need to spend some time bashing into shape at some point. But you know, I'm I'm starting I'm starting to count out one. Um, 
with the one that I had spent writing, like that was writing between 2019 and last year. But I'd written two books that came close to being novels in length when I was much younger, both terrible. I think the first one was a ripoff of Dracula, which I wrote when I was about 14. And the second one was a ripoff of Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey, which I wrote when I was about 17. Um, so let's say let's say officially one or one and a half, and we can forget about the first two. Okay, this one this one isn't a ripoff. It's uh, this is all. I hope not. All maybe, maybe subconsciously, just some ideas bled in from other uh, places. But as far as I know, it's original. And before your next Pendrive Press book, you have a book coming out with Bear Boer. I do. Yeah. And this is so. This is you described it as auto fiction slash auto critique. Yes. So, what's all that about? <laughs> so, it's. I mean, I'm still saying it's sort of like auto fiction, but also sort of auto critique. But it's also in some places fiction, and some places essay, and some places poetry. Um, it's called On Shaving or the Taxonomy of Clouds. Bit of a mouthful, but. It's all about sort of languages, inability to truly capture the nuances of life within and beyond the gender binary. Um, and it looks at sort of linguistic presentation of gender through time, both in historical documents and pop culture. So for every like old novel mentioned or old essay by Dickens mentioned, there's a reference to Norty's pop song or some sort of article found online about the stylization of beards and the sort of prevalence of beards in the last 10 years of male fashion. I mean, I think that more and more I'm becoming attuned to the fact that whatever I write about, it always comes back down to language. Uh, the Ox House is about the alphabet. I imagine an image is about how we can use letters to represent pictorial art um and i imagine and, and on shaving is much more overt i mean it's prose so it's much more overtly a critique of language and i suppose the central idea about it is that as a society we're becoming more and i mean we're becoming more and more accepting of people who do not comply with the traditional western gender binary um, and also more and more aware of the history of the conventional gender binary as sort of a rigidly European thing that's been spread around the world through a process of colonization. And despite this growing awareness, the language that we use to represent gender is still very constrictive in many ways. Um, and even with the sort of like growing societal usage of gender neutral pronouns quite often they use a sort of a denial of the traditional gender binary rather than being a new thing in and of themselves um and the book isn't like positing any alternatives or anything its genre is mixed all over the place and it's more of a sort of like poetic exploration in the tensions between this growing acceptance of gender nonconformity and this growing realization of the sort of artificiality of gender, uh, which I think is something that the vast majority of people are starting to understand is a very arbitrary and abstract thing that there's very little in relation to biological sex, which we know to be much more complicated than just simple male and female anyway. Uh, so the tension between the sort of like growing cultural understanding and the fact that the language used to represent gender is still quite rigid. Um, and it's told, yeah, through essays, through poetry, through snippets of autobiography, through snippets of fiction. Yeah, I'm excited for it to come out. Yeah. Well, again, it sounds like there's a lot of variety. So that seems to be a trademark of your work. I love novels. I love novels. I love getting lost in novels. Um, and obviously, I have a lot of love for poetry as well. And I think that part of the reason why I lean, why my tastes lean more towards experimental poetry and sort of poetry published by Pentaract Press compared with lots of free verse poetry is because I think for me, the main 
appeal of poetry is how the form interacts with the content. And my favorite poetry collections are either ones that have really strict concepts and stick with them, like a uh, Casimir Effect by Christian Book, which absolutely beautiful book that Tenter Act had published, which really, really hones in on one concept and sort of does everything it can with it and in the most beautiful way possible. And books much like your own, which have a massive variety of form. And for me, my reading interests are either absolutely mastered one form or covering loads of different bases. So I think it's only natural that my writing falls towards either one of those extremes in itself. Uh, but I also think it's just a case of like, I would just get bored if I was writing the same thing. And yeah, that's that's why I like to yeah. I work very with this, but because I've got no patience really to stick at something. So and I, I say that it's a taste thing, but it's not. It's it's a sign of my complete impatience. Uh huh. I've got great admiration for people who stick with something to the point of perfection. And I think that even though you have a wide variety of tastes, there are some things that have become sort of trademarks of your work that you yeah, are- Yeah, little, little obsessions, yeah. Highly skilled in, yeah, like palindromes. Um, and I just don't have the patience to sit down and sort of train myself to that level of mastery. And I think that's- Well, you're, you're young, you're young, you're, you're surpassable. <laughs> 20 years from now, you'll, you'll be better than all of us. <laughs> I feel like I should probably say that um, on shaving does come together to be some sort of cohesive whole. I feel like I've just sold it as a bunch of disparate elements. Uh, there is a running thread, I hope. And I think, yeah, the sort of form is reflective of the argument I'm making of this idea of how, I mean, when you're thinking of like language, language in itself is a sort of form and to what extent can forms contain forms and to what extent do these forms leak through the titles that we've given them. But that's just me trying to be pseudo-academic when really, yeah, I just get bored of writing the same thing over and over. So this is On Shaving coming with Bear Boer. Do you know, do you know which month? March, I believe. March, oh, so it's soon. Soon. And then probably less than a year on from that, uh, I imagine an image will be out from Pentrap Press. Is there anything else you're working on? Uh, you mentioned the novel, of course. Is there, is there anything in addition to that that that's upcoming? A uh, few bits and pieces that I might be more open with talking about off the record. <laughs> um, no, nothing nothing major, I think. I mean, no, no nothing major. Okay, well, I'll, I look forward to reading your Bear Boa book, and, okay. and I've already read the Pendrack one, but I look forward to seeing it in print. So, Teo, thanks so much for doing this. It's been fun. We've, we've got through thousands of years of history and a little bit of future as well. Really pleased you could do this. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it.